Night school, baby. Night school. Sorry, night school. Night school. Night school. So I completed a meditation teacher certification this morning from a website called Yoga MU. Uh, the trainer's name is Nikolai Manik. And one of the cool things about Nikolai is that he was really successful in the internet industry in Germany. Um, had one of okay. the major internet providers out there. So he is very, very hmm. wealthy and uh, doesn't really need the money from teaching yoga and meditation. But he's been meditating since he was eight. Um, his parents just recognized that his attention span was out of control. Like, we need something for this kid. So they took him and that got... That it was very good? Um, well, <laughs> no. No, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that it was really bad. They thought this kid's attention span is so good. We need to make it even better. Let's see what he could do. Let's turn him into a superhero. <laughs> this one's the Dalai Lama. <laughs> no, I think I think they probably recognize an intensity because he's such mm-hmm. a charismatic, successful person, and uh, he fully embodies the role of meditation teacher. You wouldn't guess from his demeanor that he's in internet technology or mm-hmm. the internet business. It. It seems kind of uh, weird. So yeah, he has uh, seemingly quite an intensity of energy, and I think they also <laughs> he probably had a short attention span too. So mm-hmm. he's, he got trained in meditation when he was eight. He's meditated his whole life, thrived in his own industry, and then decided to start a school. He's gotten the school up to eighteen thousand students in a year and a half. Huh. So this guy knows what he's doing. Is it just online? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's all online. Um, uh, it's a great training. I wanted to get the training because like, I, I want to start teaching meditation. I've only been meditating for a year, but that's a lot longer than a lot of people. So I, you know, I could still teach some people. Mm -hmm. Um, I recently got a job at an after school program and I wish that I was certified to teach meditation. So that was more explicitly a part of my resume. Mm -hmm. Cause the fact that I'm going to school at, uh, at Maharishi university, for consciousness and human potential, and we're studying the science of meditation, um, it's like it almost qualifies me to teach meditation. And mm-hmm. the fact that I meditate yeah. almost qualifies me. And yeah, the fact that I'm training in hypnotherapy almost qualifies me. So I wanted to have something to put on my resume so that I could apply. Um, I want to start working at the Juvie. I used to work in the Juvie out here when I was a peer counselor with Lutheran Community Services. And I want to get back into the juvie and just do my own workshops. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted a stamp that says I can teach meditation. Um, But this training turned out to really, really deepen my practice. And that surprised me because I hold uh, transcendental meditation in really high regards. And usually when I learn other techniques, I'm like, this is really cool, but it doesn't, it doesn't get me where TM does. Mm -hmm. Um, This, uh, training got me to places that tm doesn't and so that was really cool um interesting and would you say farther places or just different places so i learned like nine or ten meditation techniques um Mm -hmm. two or three of them revolutionized how i thought about meditation and then at the almost the end of the course nikolai basically said let's put all of what we've learned together and i'm going to give you your daily sadhana which is the i think i believe sanskrit word for your daily practice okay um this is the practice that you need as a teacher not everybody who comes to you is going to want something like this like this is a little weird for some people um, because it involves a certain position for your eyes a certain position for your hands a certain sitting position Mm -hmm. um, a mantra that's not that easy to remember so a lot of people are looking to sleep better or relax or have a better attention span or whatever, and they're not looking for union with the divine. Mm-hmm. Um, even if everybody might secretly be looking for something like that, it's just not, it's just not, that kind of technique's not for everybody. That technique brought me to a deeper trans- transcendent state than TM. Wow. And I did not expect that. I, I think TM is so effective. Um, but I was also really excited about that because it was a mantra that I know the meaning of. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, and it, and it involves chanting out loud, which I had never done. And, um, it involves an eye position, which I had never done a hand position, which I had never done. And, um, all of it did, uh, combine to create a technique that brought me deeper than TM. Cool. Um, like a, a deeper state of bliss during the meditation. And then also a more, evident effect after meditation 
Mm-hmm. Um, I was, I'm a handyman at a restaurant that's actually a couple doors down from where we're shooting right now. And one of the first days that I did this new meditation, which has replaced TM for me as my daily mm. go to, um, don't tell MIU cause it's required that all students, <laughs> um, but, uh, they, uh, so I, so I did the meditation. I was at work over here and I was doing work on a ladder, like probably an eight foot ladder. And I'm mm-hmm. generally nervous on ladders. I hope most people are, and I'm not a pussy because <laughs> ladders are they are ladders are nerve wracking. Yeah. Um. And I after I did the meditation because I did it on my break at work, I got back to working and climbing up and down the ladder, and my balance just felt so natural. There was no nerves on the ladder anymore, hmm. and I was able to walk up like four rungs without my hands, just naturally walk that walk up the ladder like stairs. I just felt such a, I don't know if it was a mind body connection or a body environment connection that just made me feel so in tune with how I was interacting with the ladder, Mm -hmm. but I just felt so comfortable and balanced and confident and clear and calm. Um, It's cool. Yeah, it was really nice. So um, yeah, I'll go over some of the meditations that it teaches. Cool. So yeah, I'm interested. I've, uh, I like meditation. I've mm-hmm. done quite a bit of it. I'm not mm-hmm. as transcendental. Like mm-hmm. I have not gone as deep as you have regularly, uh, but I haven't done any meditation for the last couple months. I've really right. fallen off. So and that was a good reminder. a freaking resolution for you. Mm-hmm. And so I thought it would be really cool to share some of these with you. And uh, and I, I think it'd be really cool if you'd be willing to try the really extreme one. Sure. Because, um, oh, I didn't finish what, what was so exciting to me about about this meditation that I learned in this. Uh, and I'm not going to share the details in the meditation in this video. I'm going to leave that private to the curriculum. Um, okay. But I do want to teach you the meditation separately. Um, I just don't really know what the guidelines are for for who to share it with or how to. Like, I know privately, if someone has already practiced other forms of meditation and is looking to go deeper... Um, and is explicitly looking to connect with the divine and is comfortable chanting Sanskrit and having weird looking eyes and hands and everything. Mm-hmm. It's appropriate to teach it one on one, but I don't know if it's appropriate to just put it on YouTube. So I get you. Yeah. 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 So, um, but I, I'm also excited because it's something that I can teach because TM has all these restrictions on it. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to pay a lot of money to a uh, licensed TM teacher to learn it learn it from one person, you get a mantra, you're not allowed to tell anybody your mantra. Mm -hmm. So TM isn't something you can learn and then just freely teach to your friends and family. Right. Um, This gave me a scaffolding of meditations that I can use to, it's like, oh, you're just interested in calming your mind? Like, try this. You want to have positive thoughts? Like, try this. And then Mm -hmm. if if people are are coming back, like, come on, man, give me the real shit. You know, it's like, okay, like, I'm going to teach you like a Sanskrit sentence Mm -hmm. and a melody and blah, blah, blah. So <clears throat> I love this training, man. This was the best training. Awesome. Sounds cool. Okay, so the first one that that revolution, revolutionized my practice was, it was called, Your Heart is More Powerful Than You Think. That was what the meditation or the headline of this module was called. And it's mm-hmm. funny, he's a, he has a German accent that's really friendly and charismatic. He reminds me of Wim Hof because mm-hmm. um, he has this like, he has an accent that you can understand, but everything just has an interesting spin on it, like Wim Hof. Like, yeah, it's happy, how that strong. Yeah, it's just it's almost more likable. I believe he's Dutch. I think he's from Holland. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I think it's next door though. Yeah. And and I don't know how similar those accents are generally perceived to German, or if I'm just an idiot American. But I think you're, you're good. No, uh, his, he's similar. Yeah. And and his his charisma is so Wim Hof. Mm-hmm. Um. So anyway, some of the modules have like the the titles are like slightly broken English, but in like nice. such a likable way. Like for sure, the yeah. heart is more important than you think. And it's like that's not really a good title for a module, but uh, his charisma is infectious. I get you. Anyway, the meditation. He starts by saying that a lot of meditation teachers or guided meditations will tell you to breathe in something positive and then breathe out something negative. I've heard that a lot. Yeah, and he says that that's a bad idea. Huh. Because it's conditioning your mind to be entitled to having a positive experience. And it's conditioning your mind to energetically litter in the world. Trusting that the planet or God or whatever is going to take all your negativity and transform it for you. 
And he's saying, no, <laughs> you be that to the world. Don't ask the world to be that for you. So he guided us through a meditation where we breathed in all of our own negative thoughts and feelings. And we brought them to the center of our heart. We transformed them. We transmuted them into pure love. And we breathed out pure love. Then we huh. expanded. We did that for our friends and family. And then we expanded. We did that for our community. Expanded. Did that for our country. Expanded. Did that for our planet. And afterwards, huh. the room I was in felt like it was so full of pure love because I had either put that, I mean, depending on your belief system, I had engaged in a real energetic exchange and filled the room to pure love, or I cemented the mindset that it's me who sets the tone for the room and that I chose to set the tone for the room as mm -hmm. pure love. And that to me is so much more wise and constructive than breathing in uh, peace and love and prosperity and then breathing out all the anger and tiredness and resentment. Right. They always say like, breathe, yeah, like, like what I've heard is breathe in light and breathe, like breathe, like imagine sm black, black smoke coming out of you as right. you, as you exhale. But that is and interesting. Like point to where, right. To where you're To it. where. Yeah. He yeah. says, and he says that new agers like that, they're really weak. Like, they'll go into a negative situation and be like, these are bad vibes. I'm going to go somewhere else. Wow. Yeah. 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 Good he's vibes like, only. I can't be here. There's bad vibes. What? Right. He's giving a middle finger to so the... So sensitive. Right. No, so sensitive. That's exactly how, how Nikolai would say it. So sensitive. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you only need good vibes. How about you only provide good vibes? Right. You know? Yeah. How about you're cool with any vibes and you can... What if, you're, what if your slogan was, I can transform any vibes into good ones? That's a lot more of a tough, like that's, that. a, that's spiritual warrior right there. That's tough. That's real. Yeah. That's wise. That's, you know, you're being the light to the world. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, that's very Buddhist. That's very Christian. That's very, very good advice in my opinion. And I've really enjoyed that practice. Another practice is to externalize and observe emotions and then put them back into you voluntarily. So when you're angry, he recommends that you sit, calm your physical body, calm your breathing, and then imagine yourself taking anger out of your body and moving it in front of you so that you're looking at it. You're doing this with your imagination. And then mm -hmm. you note what the anger looks like, what shape, what color, how is it moving? Mm -hmm. What does that anger look like? Once you've externalized it and observed it from a non-judgmental objective standpoint, then you voluntarily move it back into your body. Okay. And so what you're doing is you're separating, you're, you're um, breaking the habit of taking the anger personally, transcending the anger in the sense that you're now observing it instead of letting it, you're taking it off the steering wheel. Mm -hmm. um, but then you're choosing to put it back into you so you're not abandoning the aspect of you that's angry because it is a part of you that's angry but it's not you in the sense that it determines your actions or thoughts or feelings mm -hmm. if you're grounded in the right way. So you reintegrate it into your system willingly. So you go from involuntarily feeling anger that controls you to voluntarily feeling anger that does not control you through that process. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting to think because like that feels like another place where some people might say, picture the anger leaving you. <clears throat> Right. Get, get get it out. But to where? Right. It is kind of psychic garbage. Psychic garbage. Exactly. Yeah. That's That's exactly how Nikolai would say it, too, because he's saying um, you don't you don't walk around and just throw your garbage on the street. So why would you just throw your trash energy out into the world and trust that someone or something else will deal with it? Right. Um, he has a really good guided meditation on there. I won't share much about it. Um, that is about bringing you into the now, into the here and now. And it was the most effective guided meditation on experiencing the here and now that I've ever experienced. And I've listened to talks from guys like Alan Watts or Ram Dass doing mm -hmm. that same thing. And Nikolai has a voice that is particularly sincere. Um, cause, uh, cause Ram Dass and Alan Watts, um, Alan Watts characterizes himself as an entertainer rather than a spiritual teacher. And Interesting. there's some truth about that characterization to, to both of those guys, that they, they want to share spiritual truths that free 
people that um, give people salvation or liberation or freedom mm-hmm. from suffering or freedom from identification with things that are not truly you. They want that, that good intention for people, but they also want a message that's going to resonate and is going to be heard. And I don't sense any of that from Nikolai. Like, it's mm-hmm. not like, I hope everybody likes this and agrees with this and spreads this. It's kind of like after 40 years of meditation and a lot of success, mm-hmm here's what I think is the right way to do things and you can take it or leave it. So he has this grounded, humble, non-seeking sincerity to the way that he speaks. Nice. And so his guided meditations were really, really effective to me. It was a voice that I deeply trusted. Very cool. Yeah. All right. So you can look forward to that if you take the training. And then, oh, uh, he shared a Buddhist repentance prayer or Buddhist repentance mantra. Okay. And it kind of reframed the way that I, as a Christian, think about repentance because there's a lot of, um, actually to mention Alan Watts again, he offered the critique that Christianity mistakenly institutionalized guilt as a virtue. So have you mm-hmm. ever seen a Christian uh, pump up their own ego with guilt? Like, yeah, I did it, but I just feel so bad. I know I failed the Lord. Right. It's self. It's self congratulatory guilt, and yeah. um, the way that Nikolai presented this Buddhist uh, approach to repentance was all about recognizing the mistake for the purpose of not repeating the mistake. Mm-hmm. It was so um, removed from morality or judgment or ego. I found it to be a really clear way to think about repentance, and. So that way being just don't, I guess, like, don't beat yourself up over stuff. Just look at it as as evidence of what happened when you did the wrong thing so that you don't do that thing again. Yeah. But very impersonally. Yeah. I, well, I, no, I don't think it's necessarily impersonal. Okay. But I do think that it's not, uh, it's not even necessarily unemotional, but it removes it's a it's a way of repenting that doesn't congratulate the self for repenting Mm -hmm. and also doesn't um because that sort of self-congratulatory repentance um it glorifies the act of repentance like there's something noble about repenting so it, it removes that that pseudo nobility of repenting. That's the kind of institutionalized guilt I was referring to, and it also removes the counterproductiveness of dragging on repentance for too long. So it's like let's do this in a way that's direct and simple. So you could feel sad while you're repenting. That's perfectly appropriate. You can even feel guilt while you're repenting. That's appropriate too. That's human. That's normal. Mm-hmm. But you don't want to indulge in the act of repentance. And you don't want to repent for the sake of repenting. You want to repent for the sake of having action that's more skillful in the future. Sure. That's kind of the way that Buddhists think about it that I find really useful, um, that I think is useful to Christians or anyone, is to think of um, bad actions as unskillful action rather than immoral action. Because Okay, yeah. Yeah, because placing morality on it it is it tastes like blame it's flavored like blame and calling it unskillful tastes like objective observation it's flavored a, a, in an objective way you i know? like that yeah like we we were <clears throat> discussing sin on a previous episode and uh it is interesting to look at it as a lack of skill not a lack of like like any sin you could expand that to it's just a lack of skill not yeah. a lack of uh morality or right. uh integrity or something like that right because yeah. the problem with uh questioning your morality or integrity is you're questioning god in the sense that you're questioning whether people fundamentally have good intentions mm-hmm. so um in the in the mixed up institutionalized guilt kind of christian mind you would set you would do something wrong and then you would go does this mean that I might be fundamentally bad? Mm -hmm. That's what causes that um, psychological, I'm looking for a word that means like fall, like psychological disintegration. Mm -hmm. When people fall into a a guilt attack 
where they, they feel so guilty that it folds in on them and they suffer deeply. It's because they're questioning, are my intentions fundamentally bad or fundamentally good? Mm -hmm. So it's almost like they're questioning whether God or the devil runs the universe because sure the foundation of everybody is good. Like if you believe that you were created by a good creator who knew what he was doing, then you believe your intentions are fundamentally good. And when you make a mistake, you believe that that was fundamentally out of ignorance, not mm -hmm. malevolence. And if you do believe that it could have been out of malevolence, you believe that that malevolence was caused by ignorance, um, that it all goes back to unskilled, ignorant action. Um, and, and in assuming that, you assume that the universe is fundamentally good. And that, in Christian terms, is to have faith in a good God. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. So I liked his approach to repentance. Um, he also went over yoga nidra, which is yogic sleep, which is so interesting for me as a training hypnotherapist, because yoga nidra is um, it's the yoga of sleep in the sense that it's the it's the practice. Actually, let me step back and explain what yoga is. Yoga. Sure. I was actually just thinking about asking that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, a yoga is a method of achieving union. And so you could say this is something we've kind of we've philosophically uh, juggled with before. Sure, is um, you could say it's union with life itself, or a union with the source of natural law, or a union with Creator, or whatever you want to call it. A lot of people would like nature, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Union with nature and the source of nature, or a union with nature and the very ground of nature. But those terms are misleading because when you say union with something, you still imply a separation. Mm -hmm. So yoga is a way of achieving union itself, union as such. So in the state of union, you recognize that there is a fundamental sameness in everyone and everything that you observe or interact with in any way. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the modules uh, talks about the Buddha at some kind of meeting with monks teaching about what it means to be a bodhisattva, which is an, an, an awakened one who chooses to live amongst mm -hmm. ones who are not awakened in order to help the world evolve. Right. Bodhisattva to, he says that in this module, the Buddha is teaching that the bodhisattva wishes for awakening for every being, whether they're conscious of themselves or not conscious whether mm -hmm. they are embodied or whether they are not embodied. So they're a spirit or a human. Mm -hmm. Any kind of being, he wishes enlightenment for them. Yet he understands that if all of them become enlightened, none of them have learned anything. Mm -hmm. And so it's like the Bodhisattva recognizes that the universe is fundamentally unified. The Bodhisattva has the same intention for everything in existence, which is to awaken it all. Mm -hmm. And the Bodhisattva understands that there's ultimately nothing happening when you do that because everything is unified already anyway. Sure. So you're trying to awaken okay. everything to its own nature. Um, and so the Bodhisattva lives in the state of yoga, mm -hmm. whereas everyone else is on the path of yoga. Okay. So the path of yoga is the, is adopting a practice through which you attempt to achieve union. And the state of yoga is the experience of union itself. Um, so there, you would say that any, or I guess in this way of thinking, anybody that is not already in unity is on their way, whether they're doing that consciously or not. Yeah, I okay. would say that. I would say that. That was not made explicit in this training or any of the trainings I've taken, but I, I agree with that, that everybody is ultimately walking towards the same point. Evolution mm -hmm. has the same destination for everyone participating in evolution, mm -hmm. and that destination is the same as where it all started. That's how I think about the universe. Is, is that what you meant when you said that everybody that's not in union or in yoga is on the path to yoga? That's I was assuming said, right? I misspoke because I was assuming that oh, okay. um, we were talking about bodhisattvas and people who try to learn from bodhisattvas. Oh, OK. Interesting. Um, I was picturing a monastery where some of the people have already gotten it and some of the people are working on it and learning from the people who have gotten it. But I think the whole universe is that is a monastery like that. The whole sure. universe is a forum. Um, on which it's a stage on which the awakened interact with the non-awakened. Yeah, that's one way to um, classify, characterize the universe. Cool. Uh, yeah. e everyone's either awakened or not. So yeah, the whole thing is that. And right. 
everyone who's not is looking for that. And so you could say like, there's uh, one of the paths to yoga is of service. So you could say this is mm-hmm. the Christian path to yoga, that you totally lose your identity in the service of others mm-hmm. until you realize that everything is union. Or there is a sort of yoga of contemplation where you are using your, you're climbing the mind to transcendence repeatedly. Let's say once or twice a day, you're meditating until you reach transcendence. Mm-hmm. And then you're departing from that transcendence and interacting with the world. And then you're going back to transcend and then interacting with the world, transcend, interact with the world. And eventually that state of transcendence, that state of yoga that you can experience with your eyes closed integrates into your daily experience and you experience the state of yoga, whether they're closed or open, everything feels unified. So mm-hmm. it's a, in, in Maharishi's way of thinking, because the university I'm attending that talks about this, uh, Maharishi University, he says it's like dipping a white cloth into yellow dye and then letting it dry in the sun until most of the dye comes off, but it's, it's partially dyed. And going through that back and forth, back and forth, you dip it, it looks yellow. You set it out to dry, the sun takes most of the dye, you dip it back in. You keep doing that until the cloth is completely yellow. That's really how dyeing worked at, at some point in history um, until the rag was permanently dyed yellow. So you do that. You That's a one path of yoga. You transcend repeatedly until the state of yoga is not just something you can experience through the psychotechnologies offered by the yogis, but something that's intuitive to you in your daily experience all the time because you just, you know, you start to recognize. So that's a path to yoga. Okay. Um, there's a, a path of knowledge. Um, there's a lot of uh, physicists these days who are talking just like yogis and mystics because they've climbed knowledge to its conclusion. And they're like, hey, man, it's all one big thing. And there's a book you can get at Barnes & Noble called uh, You Are the Universe. It's written by, I believe, a physicist about how science has reached the conclusion that what you should fundamentally identify as is the universe, not mm-hmm. your individual self. Is that Brian Green? I don't think so. Oh, okay. No. No, yeah. it's it's not. It's not okay. Brian Green. Um, but he's got some mystical sounding stuff and sure. there's another popular book called No Self, No Problem, How Neuroscience is Catching Up with Buddhism. So it also feels like Chris Langan of the CTMU yes. is a good example of that. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, these are all paths to yoga. Science is a yoga because science is leading to truths that um, I mean, we're all personally curious about the the problems that we're trying to address and the questions that we're trying to answer with science. Mm-hmm. Um, and the most interesting question is what are we fundamentally and what the hell are we up to? And that question for a long time has been a philosophical or religious question, but mm-hmm. science has become a yoga. People have achieved the state of union through the pursuit of knowledge, even if they didn't necessarily realize that's what they were doing. So, mm-hmm. so those are yogas. Yoga Nidra is yogic sleep. So this is, the way this is the path of learning to sleep intentionally. Now that's significant because, um, according to Maharishi's model and according to the model that Nikolai presented in this training, there are three fundamental states of consciousness that everybody knows about. Not fundamental in the sense of fundamental to the universe, fundamental to the materialist paradigm. Okay. Waking, sleeping, and dreaming. You're awake or you're sleeping and dreaming. Or you're sleeping and you're not dreaming. Okay. Waking, sleeping, dreaming. The fourth state is called transcendental consciousness in Maharishi's model. In this training, that state was called another word, um, a Sanskrit word I don't remember. I apologize. I'll see if I can look it up real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, and, nah, I don't want to bother. It's not important. We're not going to remember the word anyway after I read it. Sure. So, But they have that same state identified, and they actually say that it translates as transcendental consciousness. They use the exact phrase that Maharishi does, and I found that interesting. And Transcendental consciousness is the transition point between waking, sleeping, and dreaming. So the modern scientists call it hypnagogic sleep, a hypnagogic state. Yeah. Um, But it is a direct experience of union itself. So it's the transition point between those states, and it's also the fourth state of consciousness in the sense that one can learn how to consciously and intentionally access that state. Yoga Nidra is wow. one way to intentionally access that state, because if you learn to intentionally, on purpose, go to sleep, 
you will start to recognize the bridge that you have to cross to get to the sleeping state. And that bridge is what we are looking for in meditation. So this is one way of experiencing union internally. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's fascinating because the hypnagogic state is uh, so often where people report having shamanic or otherwise spiritual experiences mm-hmm. that that is this like right when you're falling asleep is when you have those experiences. So it's interesting that it's like, uh, so you're saying is the hypnagogic state you are equating with the transcendental consciousness? Yes. Wow. Yes. But there's all, okay. it's also important to keep in mind that there is a spectrum of consciousness. Mm-hmm. And so, um, if like right on this paper right here, if this is waking and this is sleeping and this is transcendental consciousness, you, um, and I, so I've draw, I draw a W at the bottom of the page and S at the top of the page for sleeping. So this mm-hmm. is waking to sleeping. And then I draw a small line between W and S. This is a spectrum from W all the way to S, from waking to sleeping. So if you were here, if you were just a smidge away from transcendental consciousness at the center, Mm -hmm. you could potentially have an extremely profound and deep experience that isn't transcendental consciousness itself. The point Hmm. where you flip over from waking to sleeping is by definition, uh, the, it, it is transcendental consciousness, but that's, it's I can't exactly call it a point because mm-hmm. it's timeless. There's no such thing as experiencing transcendental consciousness for a certain amount of time because you're actually glimpsing the aspect of reality that transcends time and space. Right. So people who experience transcendental consciousness, MIU has done a lot of good research on this, having people describe these experiences and collecting those descriptions. They have no sense of time. They have no sense of space. They have no sense of personal identity or body. Mm -hmm. They are aware only of awareness. But right next door to that experience, you can have some really, really profound visionary experiences or manifestation experiences. So if you're if you're somewhere between waking and sleeping Mm -hmm. and you're extremely close to transcendental consciousness, you might have crazy visions. You might see yourself like dancing with the very archetypes of the universe and you can see all of them and talk to them or you might. Um, you might in that state wish for something and then wake up and the next day have it through insane synchronicities just appear. But any of those powerful experiences are not transcendental consciousness itself. They're just so close on the consciousness spectrum to that point that a lot of doors are open. Hmm. Transcendental consciousness, the, the center of the hypnagogic state is awareness only of awareness. So if someone says, oh, I completely transcended, I saw the gods, no, 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 no. If you completely transcended, you saw nothing, you felt nothing, you thought nothing. Your reference points were non-existent. If it happened for a certain amount of time, it wasn't transcendental consciousness. So does that clear up the difference between those powerful creative experiences and the point that lies exactly between the states? No. Okay, so... Like, I'll, I'll kind of show you with my arms right here. So mm-hmm. this is waking. This is sleeping. So, and this right here is transcendental consciousness. This okay. is the point where you flip over from one state to the other. Okay. What if you're right here? Mm-hmm. What if you're a millimeter away from the point where you flip over? You're so close to the source of consciousness. You're so close to the experience only of awareness that you have access to realms of your mind that you don't normally have access to. Got it. So the closer you get to the point, the more intense maybe your experiences could be. Exactly. However, at that point, your experiences would be exactly nothing. Exactly. Okay. That's one hundred percent right. Okay. So, um, so scientists would 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 make the mistake as they're learning this stuff of saying, um, yeah, transcendental consciousness is real because we know all of these authors and philosophers and mathematicians who report being right between waking and sleeping and having some, like crazy vivid visionary experience mm-hmm. that is that is not transcendental consciousness that that's just something that happened while you were very close to it so that will be you know cleared up over the years as we integrate this old stuff with science but um mm-hmm. but because there's there's the ground of consciousness there's let's say the point where y- the universe is one and then let's say the point where the universe is two 
and then all the numbers up. So we're fundamentally unified because one is the first number. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the universe didn't start as a two. So it, fundamentally, we're all one. Um, if you're, let's say you, you're, right now, we're at levels that are like numbers we couldn't possibly comprehend. The mm -hmm. amount of divisions that have occurred in the universe up to this point are, sure. are so innumerable. But if you were down to the point of the, the 12, you know, the kinds of experiences that you could have, it's like, like what if you, you could come up with a whole comedy special in a second because you made contact with the jester archetype of the cosmos, mm -hmm. you know, crazy things can happen there. But if what you're going for is transcendental consciousness, every single time one of those powerful experiences come up, this is Nikolai's advice. You have to shrug it off. Say, hey, this, uh, that's not what I'm here for. That's very interesting, but that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to just experience awareness of awareness itself. I'm not interested in astral projecting to Mars or talking to an angel or seeing all these flashy colors that are outside of the light spectrum that I've seen on Earth. This is all very fascinating, but mm -hmm. I'm only looking for the peace and harmony of awareness of awareness. So just you just keep on going. You're the boss. You just keep on with your mantra or with yeah. whatever you're doing until you get there. Um, but yogic sleep can get you there because you can get to that exact transition point. And um, there's this, there's a neuroscientist at, I believe Stanford named Andrew Huberman mm -hmm. who has been doing research. And he said that he made up an acronym for yoga, for yoga Nidra because scientists are dorks and they like acronym. He said they like acronyms almost as much as the military does. So <laughs> he called it NSDR, which is non sleep deep rest. And in that category, he places yoga Nidra and uh, hypnosis. So they're doing research on those states and they're yeah. calling them non-sleep deep rest because that works for for nerds that sounds like a good like a good acronym it is that a government agency would like yeah it's pretty close to nerd <laughs> it's <laughs> if you added an e it yeah. would be nerds if yeah. you mixed it around and added an e nerds yeah, yeah so um that's enough on yoga nidra. Okay. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> yoga nidra is, is so fucking interesting to me as I'm training as a hypnotist because, mm -hmm. uh, because hypnosis and yoga nidra both point to the fact that there are states we can access where we are conscious in the way that we are when we're awake, but we're resting in the way that we are when we're asleep. And those states are actually more restful than the kind of unintentional sleep that we stumble into at night. And that's so interesting to me. They're Whoa. more restful, but you remain aware during them. That's true for for yoga nidra and hypnosis. Huh. So interesting. Like this is kind of a tangent, but could one uh, cut out sleep from their life for a far more efficient NSDR practice? No, uh, okay. NSDR should complement sleep. Got it. Um, the reason is that when you sleep and you go through the process of completely releasing control of your mind your mind is able to integrate all the things that you experience through the day organize uh, some things into memories that are stored for long-term storage memories that just get thrown away mm -hmm. um, you'll release little traumas that you experience throughout the day through visionary experiences so unless you're extremely developed in a way that neither of us need to worry about for many years, you need to completely release control and awareness of your brain and let yourself fall completely into sleep so that it can do everything that it needs to do for self maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how it works when extremely advanced gurus and yogis can uh, remain conscious throughout sleep, but I assume that they are able to detach from the mind the from yeah, detach from the mind and observe that process as it happens without interfering with it. Mm -hmm. They just watch the brain aimlessly dream, bring in images, store things, throw things out, integrate things, re-experience, release. They just watch it do all of that. Mm -hmm. And they are just an observer. And when it's done, they allow themselves to then wake up. Um, MIU has demonstrated evidence that there are people who live in that state. They call that state cosmic consciousness. Mm -hmm. And the evidence is that uh, transcendental consciousness is marked by alpha one EEG coherence. Mm -hmm. That means that many areas of the brain are firing neurons at a pace of eight to 10 seconds and of similar intensity to one another. Okay. And that state of coherence is associated with transcendental consciousness. 
um, they've demonstrated that because people who fall asleep pass through the state of alpha-1 EEG coherence. So they have evidence that it exists between the states. They have evidence that it exists between sleeping and dreaming, between dreaming and sleeping, between sleeping and waking, between waking and dreaming, all the way. So they've, they've re recorded that. Mm -hmm. Then they've recorded that people who practice TM experience alpha-1 EEG coherence. So they've mapped this. And then they've mapped that some people who report um, remaining aware throughout sleep have higher alpha-1 EEG coherence um, it, I think you could call it background coherence. So it's coherence accompanied by whatever else their brain is doing throughout all of the states, throughout dreaming, throughout sleeping, throughout waking. So mm. MIU has recorded evidence that there are people who remain aware. They've, they've recorded that through subjective accounts and they have EEG evidence to back up those subjective accounts. So there is a such thing as remaining aware through sleep. Now those people are essentially doing yoga nidra or hypnosis instead of sleep. But unless you're advanced enough to allow your brain to do everything it needs to do during sleep without interfering with it, you should not try to just do hypnosis instead of sleep because you'll interfere with your unconscious mind's ability to do the maintenance that it needs to do. Right. Yeah, I'm sure some people have lost their mind trying to go down that path. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. For sure. Because we just... we. We don't know. I mean, at our level of development, we have no idea what the hell the mind has to do when we sleep. It's so complicated. Right. Yeah. There's, I mean, read one of Jung's books on dreams. You know, if you want to see how complicated what happens in those states is, it's just we need to just let it, let you know, let it do its thing. But you can, yeah. you can sleep six and a half hours instead of eight, and do a half hour of yoga nidra or guided hypnosis that you find online that works really well for you. You can do that. Let your brain do its thing. Get a little less sleep and supplement. Sure. The other practices, I, I don't think that that's a problem. Nice. Yeah. So um, then another meditation that he shared was just focusing on one point. And he had us focus on a point that was in the center of a, I believe it was called a mandala. I think it had a, a different name, but one of those like sacred geometry pattern tapestries, sure. you know. Of course. One of those images stare at the center of it for 10 minutes. And that was really, really cool because the universe is fundamentally unified secondarily diversified and there's something about staring at a point in the center of a sacred geometrical image that um alludes to that fact that the universe is fundamentally unified and secondarily diversified it's like your focus is on the point in the center and all of the rest is in your peripherals so the unity of the center is primary to your attention and your peripherals see all the diversity but as you stare it hmm something changes about your visual awareness where the whole thing starts to look like it's not peripheral or in focus. The whole thing comes into picture after a while. And I believe huh. you shared something about this in a book written by a samurai. Yeah, Miyamoto Musashi's The Book of Five Rings. Yes, what uh, did he say about that? Well, he kind of talked about how people are like use their eyes incorrectly and that you shouldn't be just like focusing on points that you should be kind of expanding your gaze to be looking and that if you train correctly you don't need to like focus on a point if you i believe the term was soften your gaze if you like yeah, soften yeah, your that. gaze relax your eyes a little bit you can it seemed that what i interpreted what he was saying as is that if you can unfocus your eyes you can learn to get the benefit of the thing. Right now, when we focus on something, we can see all the details of it, but you can see all those details of everything if, right. you, will unfoc if you will unfocus your eyes right. a bit and that he would never focus on a specific point. He would look, not focus. Right. Yeah. So I think if you want to train your eyes to do that, you could try this practice of for 10 minutes at a time and go longer as it gets more comfortable staring at the center of one of those sacred geometrical images interesting I, th I think it's a way of training your eyes to do that cool but that's kind of a personal hypothesis yeah so um dude another one of the pieces of this training that was so interesting was his stuff on the om um o m mm. yeah um it's also interchangeably represented as a u m and uh okay. the so if you relax your mouth and you open it maybe it's like an quarter three quarters of an inch an inch i don't really know because uh, i don't look at my mouth when i open it and do mantras but um it's ah uh, and if you close it a little bit it naturally goes from uh, um, 
So those are the three sounds that you can oh. make with your mouth totally relaxed. Um, okay. And you remember I mentioned a couple podcasts ago that when you chant, you want your mouth to be as relaxed as possible. Like you don't want to push out the air. You want to just allow the air to come out, but shape your throat in such a way that it comes out in that way, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. that it comes out as the mantra, but it's not you pushing the air out. You can inhale effortlessly, exhale effortlessly. Everybody does that every day. Mm -hmm. But when the exhale happens, you just put the, you almost put the air effortlessly through a stencil, a vocal stencil that makes it sound like that mantra yeah. rather than ooh, trying to push out your mantra. But I didn't realize until I took this training from uh, Nikolai that, that those are the three sounds that you can make with total effortlessness. And that those three sounds combined are the sound om. Um, That's an interesting thought. Yeah. But the most important part of the om um mantra is the silence at the end. The A represents waking. The U represents sleeping. The M represents dreaming. Or maybe sleeping and dreaming are flipped. And the silence at the end of the om um represent transcendental consciousness. The, mm -hmm. the temporary experience of internal unity that, that, that we're looking for in meditation. Um, Interesting. And then he also pointed out that in the Om symbol, mm -hmm. um, let me see if I can just pull one up on this computer. Would you mind taking this mouse and doing that? Sure. Looking up the, the Sanskrit Om symbol. Um, so, dude, it's so intuitive. It's an apple. You can just do everything. I love how I just know where to go for oh, everything. Right. I just, I just pop <laughs> You're going to want to click right on the up. rocket ship. At the bottom left. Yeah. The launch, launch pad. pad. Yeah. And then you're going to want to click on Safari. Okay. 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 That's <laughs> so stupid. So. I'm 80. The. So easy. The waking, sleeping, dreaming, and transcendental uh, states are represented in the Ohm symbol. So the sort of three looking symbol on the bottom left, it has two main curves. Um, sorry for those who are audio only. So the Ohm symbol basically looks like a number three. Mm -hmm. And then there's a hook coming off of that three. Mm -hmm. So the biggest swoop in the three, I believe, was w waking. And then you had, I believe, dreaming on the top. I could mix those three up, but uh, that's not as important as what the, as how transcendental consciousness is represented. The bottom three swoops are waking, sleeping, and dreaming. The dot at the top represents transcendental consciousness. And the line between the three standard or materialist or whatever you want to call them states uh, is illusion or Maya. So this okay. symbol is pointing out that you have three states that you know of, but illusion separates you from the fourth state. And it's also interesting that it's represented as a dot because you could say, um, you know, you can experience transcendental consciousness by staring at a certain point. Mm -hmm. Um, just like you can experience transcendental consciousness by experiencing, by repeating one mantra so many times that you get to the source of the word. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you zoom into anything in the universe far enough, you find the unified field. That's a physical theory. Mm -hmm. um, but to put that in yoga terms, if you focus on any point or mantra or sound or whatever you want to do for long enough, you'll perceive the source of that object that you've chosen to fix your attention on. Um, and so the fact that it's represented in a point, I think, alludes to that idea. So... Then, um, yeah, just moving on to another one. So guided, sure. he taught guided meditations. And this is another thing that was interesting to me as a, hypnot as a training hypnotherapist is his basic format for guided meditations is you relax the person, you make a, suggest a positive suggestion to the person while they're extremely relaxed, and then you wake them up all the way. It's very important to wake them up all the way. Hmm. You really drill that in hy hypnosis too. You actually de-hypnotize people by hypnotizing them and then unhypnotizing them. Yeah, we've discussed that idea. Yeah, that you can end up undoing the hypnosis that people didn't even know they were under. Right. Because yeah. the, the average everyday person is uh, not fully aware of what the hell they're doing or why. You know, if you ask them, like, hey, what are you doing right now? They'll just kind of be like, I, what? Like, I, I like they're. Right. People, I, I think people go off the deep end sometimes with the, um, what's it called? Um, 
simulation theory shit mm -hmm. when they make the accusation that other people aren't real. I think that's a sort of a gateway to a psychotic break. Sure. Um, cause, but people, they're onto something when they get this weird sense that some people aren't real. I think they're recognizing the fact that a lot of people are in such a trance state yeah. that it's hard to recognize choice, free will, or agency yeah. as you observe them. They don't look awake. They don't look like you don't see agency. Right. Agency is the ability to choose what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, where and when. Um, and some people just don't look like that. Now, yeah, some yeah. people have that agency and it just doesn't doesn't look like it. But a lot of people have fallen into a trance. Yeah. Um, like people who take whatever was on the news last week and they just go, hey, you know, you know what's on the news and they're just kind of dead in the eyes and it just doesn't feel like they know why exactly they're relaying what was on the news or yeah. what they think is productive about relaying what's on the news or what their original thoughts are about what was on the news. They're just kind of like, well, you know, with what's on the news, they're like assuming that you're in this shared dream with them where that's what's relevant right now. It's yeah. like what I have goals that I'm working on. That's what's relevant to me. I don't know what the hell you're on about. Yeah. And, th and so People who come off as non-playable characters, you can help them by hypnotizing them deeply and then waking them up all the way. Um, you'll kind of, it's its like a way of grabbing someone, pushing them back and then jerking them forward and going, snap out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, and so that's really cool to know, like, because um, a lot of the, the high schoolers that I interact with at work are like half asleep all the time. It's so bizarre. Right. Um, partially that's because their diet is so atrocious thanks to yep. the education that they get in school and sure. uh, partially their sleep habits uh, tend to be worse than adults because um, they play video games late and play on their phone late and things like that. And right. So I, partially that's, it's that they've got one foot in this world and one foot in the digital world. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the phones are very hypnotizing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, but that's really interesting to me. And I, and I, it made me think that, I have a lot more learning to do about what exactly the difference is between, say, say yoga nidra, guided meditation, shamanic journeying, hypnosis. Where the hell are we drawing the lines between these? Like, is right. this all just mixed up language? Because um, I, I read a definition of hypnosis recently that I think applies to yoga nidra and I think applies to guided meditation. I think applies to shamanic journeying. I think applies to hypnosis and that... That came from the gateway, the, the report on the gateway experience by the U.S. Army. It was a lieutenant colonel who was writing to a commander mm -hmm. about how the Monroe Institute in Virginia is using binaural beats to induce out-of-body experiences. And the Monroe Institute, who's behind that again? Robert Monroe. Okay. Who wrote three phenomenal books, one of which I'm reading right now, um, Journeys Out of the Body, Far Journeys, and The Ultimate Journey. Okay. Um, he was a researcher into audio science who accidentally started astral projecting and then found a way to teach astral projection through binaural beats. So cool. what, okay. um, and to connect binaural beats with yoga real quick, just for fun. Um, some people, and this actually, I learned this in the gateway report as well. So some people have spontaneously experienced Kundalini awakenings because their car vibrated at a certain frequency. That frequency is between five and five and seven or six and eight. It's not a frequency that you can hear. But those wow. who have pioneered binaural beat technologies have learned that there's a trick you can play on the brain. If you play 140 on the left ear and play 147 on the right ear, the brain will accidentally split the difference and perceive seven and send a code to the brain as though seven hertz is being experienced. So hmm. um, that certain frequency triggers... And energy, this has been documented. This is not just a yogic theory anymore. This has been documented. You can read um, Lee, fuck, what is it? Lee Sinella, Lee Tapella, something like that. He wrote Psychosis or Kundalini Awakening. Mm -hmm. So if you want to read scientific perspective on this. But uh, okay. a certain frequency causes a sharp energy to shoot up your spine and cause discomfort but bliss. And then that results in either an extremely awakened state or an extremely unstable psychotic state that can't be treated with modern medicine. And so um, binaural beats are ways of 
giving the nervous system experiences of frequencies using audio that can't be heard through the ears. So it's really interesting technology. But mm-hmm. anyway, that same gateway report, I'm, I'm, this is getting to a definition of hypnosis that I think applies to all these different psychotechnologies. Okay. In that gateway, gateway report, he describes, um, he starts by describing three technologies that you want to understand before you understand out-of-body experiences. They're hypnosis, transcendental meditation, and biofeedback. And so with okay. to hypnosis, he says, what hypnosis is, is the hypnotist distracts the left brain, the logical brain, into a sleep state so that it can communicate with no filter directly to the right brain. Huh. So I'm taking your logical part and I'm going, look over here, look right. over here. So when I, I, I didn't realize this is why I was doing this, but I, it's something I'm intuitively understanding as I'm training in hypnotherapy. I like to use imagery that doesn't make sense. It helps the person relax. Sure. When I hypnotized our sister, I told her she was in a tent in the, in, in the forest and her kids were playing outside. But then there was a back door to the tent and there were stairs down. That was an induction method. If it made sense, the logical brain stays on board. But imagine that you take a classroom full of students half art students and half mathematics students. And you just start talking about the way of being that is a knowing and a blossoming and a a becoming. All those mathematics students are going to fall asleep. Sure. All those art students are going to pay attention. You're going to connect there. So that's what you're doing to an individual mind through hypnosis. You're saying shit that makes the math side, the logic side just go, fuck this, man. I'm out. I'm good on this. But the rest stays there. Mm -hmm. So you can communicate directly with the pleasure centers. You can tell someone they're floating in the clouds and they'll feel like they are. So through yoga nidra and guided meditation and hypnosis, I think that same effect is happening. I think you're putting the logical part, the questioning part, the filter part to sleep and providing an experience directly to the creative part. Mm -hmm. But then you want people ultimately to be able to meditate on their own. You're guiding them into meditation Because you want them to experience the bliss that they can experience through meditation. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that they have the, that they are empowered and equipped to experience that bliss on their own. Sure. That's what you ultimately want. Mm -hmm. Just like you can drop LSD and you can feel like you're living in a state of consciousness that's pure love and pure unity. But when the trip is over, the trip is over. But it gave you a goal. It gave you something to strive for. It gave you a taste of something. Mm -hmm. That's what's, what's so positive about it. So same thing with guided meditation. You're going... You think meditation's boring? Like I'm working with a, a, a friend right now making guided medita- making a guided meditation series. I'm making a program to get her to where she can meditate on her own. She's meditating for five minutes and she says when she gets used to that, she's going to go up to six. I'm like, fuck, man. Fuck. That is, you're really missing the point. Because if meditation is that boring that you're going, I can do 45 more seconds of this, then You've never tasted the bliss. Mm-hmm. You've never tasted the bliss that you can taste in meditation. So let me show you that. Then let me show you how I got you there. Then let me show you how you can get there. Then let me show you how you can get there without a voice talking yeah. to you. So that's the beauty of guided meditation. If someone's inexperienced, they just don't really know what they have to look forward to in meditation. Yeah. And that is how Nikolai presents it, not with the LSD metaphor. That's not his style, but... Uh, use guided meditation, get inexperienced people interested in meditation and to understand kind of the mechanics of it. But with hypnosis or guided meditation, you're deactivating the logic brain and giving an experience to the creative brain. With meditation, the person is independently creating coherence. So EEG Hmm. coherence can be established a few different ways. Um, People under the influence of LSD have, have extreme EEG coherence, as in different parts of the brain vibrating at the same intensity and frequency mm-hmm. neurons firing at the same intensity and frequency yeah um in transcendental meditation people have it and in binaural beats you can establish it very very effectively and it in coherence it's valuable it's a state of extreme integration that's what we're trying to do with our personalities we're trying to integrate them mm-hmm. we're trying to get every part of ourselves on the same page so we're whole you know, that's what the psychotherapists say. I want you to be more whole. I don't want you to be good or what people want you to be. I want you to be whole. I want you to be integrated. I want right. every part of yourself to contribute to the great project that is you. And cooperate. Yeah, and cooperate yeah. with each other and cooperate yeah. with you, the leader of the whole damn thing. Sure. So 
um, through meditation, you want people to be able to put themselves in a state of extreme coherence and integration. For sure. You're not doing that for them when you hypnotize them or guide them because mm -hmm. you're telling half of them, you're tricking half of them and helping the other half of them. So that's why it's so important for them to be able to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. You want them to be able to organically create coherence and integration. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So... Uh, another tip he shared was uh, if you're doing a meditation where you're picturing something, so you could do a kind of meditation where you're pulling up an image in your head and then focusing mm -hmm. on that image mentally for a certain amount of time, it helps a lot to keep your attention if you imagine it glowing in kind of a divine holy way. Okay. Just a random tip. Huh. Um, and then, yeah, I'll, I'll wrap this up. There's another big section called the yamas and niyamas that are essentially the do's and don'ts. Say, can you say it again? Sure, yeah, the yamas and niyamas. Okay. Y-A-M-A -A and N-I-Y-A-M-A. -A. Okay. You know what's so funny about Sanskrit is all of the words are like, banana na 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 It's always like Just the yama and the niyama. <laughs> yeah, A is for days. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and repetitive syllables. So it'd be like, was it the Mahabharata or the Dahadabhadabhata? It's like so <laughs> hard to remember what yeah. the hell the words are. It's so funny. Um, but they are the ethical do's and don'ts of the way of yoga. So I'll just read them real quick. Okay. I, and this is really important stuff, but I don't want to go all day with this because I want people who are interested in the training to be able to just get a taste here and get excited about it. The training is... It's a 100-hour certification. It doesn't take 100 hours. Um, if you do all the optional reading, like they post the Tao Te Ching, they post the Bhagavad Gita, they post the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. These are three essential texts about understanding the state of unity. It's mm -hmm. optional reading. If you do the optional reading, if you do all the exercise, you can get 100 hours of content on it. But um, it's an easy course. It's an enriching, inspiring course, and it's super affordable. So um, I don't want to share everything, but yeah. So the yamas, the sure. don'ts are so nonviolence, um, no lying. You need to be truthful, right energy, and that has a particular emphasis on not wasting sexual energy. So this is something. Hmm. Uh, I guess I will go on a tangent here. I decided to to go down a rabbit hole on this a little bit because they said that extremely powerful people. They named a Carnegie and a Rockefeller know how to use their sexual energy for their for for higher benefits than immediate pleasure. And I started looking up interviews and tips about this and Kevin Gates had an interesting one on a radio show. He's like, "Oh, I don't come." Sorry, I don't, I don't know who that is. Kevin Gates? I got two phones. One for the don and one for the I don't oh. know all the rest of the words. He's a rapper. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's uh, one of Noe's favorite rappers. He's a real gangster rapper. Okay. He's doing this interview about how he doesn't come. Huh. He's like, I don't waste my energy. Like, you know how much energy and information and data and energy there is in in sperm? Like, I don't waste that. And it's one of Noe's favorite rappers? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Noe told us a funny story. <laughs> it's just interesting. It's yeah. just an interesting connection. So, uh, Noe's a fucking savage, dude. So, Kevin Gates was saying, oh, and not cussing is one of them. Um no, he was, uh, Kevin Gates was saying that, uh, uh, he will only orgasm with a woman if it's for a specific intention or purpose. And outside of that, he won't. Hmm. And I'm like, man, there's something interesting here. So one morning I wanted to jerk off and I just felt like I wanted to for the physical pleasure. Like I had the sexual urge to jerk off and I was like, it just doesn't feel right. Like I mm -hmm. would rather experiment with um, transmuting that energy into something better. So I started watching YouTube videos. Most of them are annoying garbage. and um, But I found a good technique. So what I did was I imagined energy concentrated in my sexual center, like around that chakra at the bottom of my spine. Um, and I did an inhale. So it was... As I inhale, I imagine that energy moving from the bottom of my spine, from my from my sexual organ, mm -hmm. into the bottom of my spine. And as I inhale, it moves up my spine. And once it's spread throughout my spine, I exhale like this. So for those audio only, I have my mouth open and my mouth is kind of pointed up like I'm like spraying out something. But I'm spraying it. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm just coming with my spine now. Yeah. So no, I'm sp I'm I'm in the same way that we transmuted negative energy into love, 
I'm doing that with the energy that's concentrated in my sexual center. So I'm, mm-hmm. so I'm blowing out love. <laughs> that's really funny imagery. <laughs> but love. I'm imagining love <laughs> coming out of my head. Yeah. My, my <laughs> <laughs> It's just not working, it's bro. It's not working. That's fine though. You still get the point. It's fine. Yeah. So and then um and then another part of it is as the energy moves from the base up your torso, you're flexing the muscles. So you're flexing at the bottom like your PC muscle, which is the PC muscle that's the muscle like on your taint. That's mm-hmm. the muscle that you would use to stop urinating. Okay. Flex that muscle and then like butt and hips and then stomach and then chest and then shoulders and then neck. Careful with that. Don't flex your neck too hard. And then face and and then I imagined the energy dissipating throughout my body and just my whole body being full of a, a energy from a new source. And what I realized through that exercise is that calling certain energy sexual energy, like someone say, I have a lot of sexual energy pent up. It's like saying I have a lot of fast food money pent up. Like I have too much fast food money. Like, mm-hmm. no, it's, it's just money. Like you're spending, it's concentrated in the domain of fast food and your finances it, you're spending too much money on fast food, but it's not fast food money. It's not sexual energy. You have a blockage in your internal energy system that causes too much to be stored in the sexual center, but the energy is not sexual. So you can get the energy from that center and you can spread it throughout your body and you can imagine yourself transforming it into love and making it of benefit to the world rather than of pleasure to the self. Mm-hmm. And that's a wiser and more beneficial thing to do with energy than jerk off. Because you're going to feel good for a couple minutes, but then you have a little bit less energy afterwards, and it just yeah. doesn't really pay off. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't feel noble because it's only about the self. But that's the same thing for jerking off or eating a bag of Cheetos or smoking a cigarette or smoking weed or anything that's just about the self. Yeah. It's the same thing as breathing in positivity and breathing out negativity. It's doing something that is only to benefit the self. The world gets worse when you eat a bag of Cheetos. You know what I mean? Like, yes, like yeah. the whole world gets worse when you eat a bag of Cheetos because yeah. you've just wasted plastic. You've you're gonna throw that in the trash. Yeah. You're going to feel like shit. It's bad for your body. You're going to shit out something that's not even enriching to the ocean. Right. I mean, like, it's just you're and you're you're also supporting an industry that is actively and intentionally poisoning our, poisoning our children. Right. Um, it's By just consuming its poison on purpose. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Knowing it's poison. Yeah. So the whole thing, yeah. doing something for the service of self alone, that's not of benefit to everyone else. It's not n- ennobling or enriching. And um, so I, I really recommend that you try that one time when you want to jerk off, like I'm going to try transmuting this energy um, into strength. Or transmuting this energy into alertness. And imagine yourself, you clench your PC, your butt and hips, your stomach, your chest, your neck, your face. and But you're not blowing out sexual energy. You're just blowing out energy. And so you're saying like, I'm going to take this and instead of pleasure myself with it, I'm going to share this energy with the world in the form of love. And mm-hmm. I'm going to dissipate it throughout my body in the form of power and, al- and, and to my mind as alertness. You can do whatever you want with it. You stop spending money on fast food. What, do you, what, op- what are your options? Anything. Just whatever you want to spend that on. Same, same thing. With, huh? Guns. 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 You could buy yeah. guns. Guns, drugs, hookers. Things yeah. that will bring you more pleasure than fast food that you have to save up for that take discipline. So... Um, Okay, so right energy. Specific- I, I, I still wanted to yeah, say please. on the on the sexual energy thing how neatly that fits with what Costa Danos and John Chang of Magus of Java and Nay Kung, what they had to say about uh, about coming that like your chi is stored in your cum. When you come, you get weaker. Mm-hmm. Uh, that Costa would say that if he like if he did come, his powers would get significantly weaker. Like his chi abilities would get significantly weaker for like a day. But if he did it like a few times within a day, then it would take like a few days before he would get his abilities back. Right. Um, right. And it, I, the impression I got was that John Chang, uh, basically never came unless it was to have kids. Right. I, I think that was pretty much what he was doing. Right. Yeah. That's the smartest thing that you can do with that energy. I mean, but uh, it, what's possible is possible. You know, mm-hmm. there's no reason to like try to strive for that immediately. 
it's sure. whatever. Yeah. Jerk off tomorrow and then try transmuting it into something better the next day. You know, just try mm-hmm. it. Like I, I have found like just kind of as a side note that when I make a practice out of yoga and meditation and self hypnosis and these positive psycho technologies, mm-hmm. um, vices naturally fall off. It's not right. like I have to try not to like, like, I made a bunch of jokes about smoking cigarettes the last episode. I haven't smoked cigarettes since then just because I've been doing more meditation and yoga. So I just yeah. haven't really wanted a cigarette because it's like, well, what am I going to smoke a cigarette for? In the morning for alertness, in the afternoon for calmness. Meditation will give me more of both of those. Yeah. So it's like if I wanted to watch porn, I would. If I wanted to smoke a cigarette, I would. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I told Brooke I don't watch porn. So then, you know, I wouldn't for that reason. Um, but basically, like, all of the vices that I've had throughout my life that I don't practice anymore um, have fallen off because I've just allowed them to coexist with positive habits that are like positive vices, I guess you would say. Sure. Until the positive vices just serve my purposes better and just become sure. a, a yeah. selfishly a better choice. Yeah. You no. Know? Positive choices always beget more positive choices. Like right. It's... um. Because it can end up feeling really easy if you've already made one shitty decision. Like, well, I guess this is a shit day. Right. Guess I'm going to behave like a dumpster for this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I haven't really been, like, alcohol hasn't interested me in a few months. Like, I drank for Brooke's birthday because it feels like a thing. Sure. But, you know, it wasn't fun. I didn't have fun because I'm like, I miss clarity. I miss sure. like meditating. I miss coming out of meditation and being able to run up a ladder like stairs. It fucking it feels like yeah. clarity. Like all of the seven the seven uh, C's, not the seven oceans. That's so funny. The seven letters C that we learned about in uh, "It's Not Always Depression" by Hilary Hendel. The clear, calm, confident, courageous. Um, I never remember all seven of them, but all of those like those are really what we're looking for. When I smoke a cigarette or uh, smoke weed or anything, I'm looking for that. Mm-hmm. But I get that, all of those qualities more from yoga and meditation yeah. and prayer and scripture and exercise. It's like, it just starts to, the other things just start to lose their edge. Sure. Um, yeah, so anyway, oh, non-greed is another uh, yama. Um, so non-violence, truthfulness, right energy, non-greed. He said to support non-greed he gives exercises for each of those which is really cool he gives you like a little homework assignment that you can do or a way to reflect on them with non-greed he said to 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 combat greediness in your character imagine that you're a being of light that is stuck on the earth and it's stuck on the earth because there's anchors attached to it that are attached to the earth and Mm -hmm. those anchors are attachments or like lusts they're, mm-hmm. they're like lust or attachment or gluttony, um, jealousy. If you desire for things that are here. Yeah. Desire, desire for, for physical things. Desire for things that are here. Keep mm-hmm. you stuck here. Those are the anchors that keep you stuck on earth. And maybe even this stuck in the cycle of reincarnation, if that's your thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and the ability to transcend this earth depends on you not wanting those anchors anymore. Those anchors are not attached to you like barbs you're mm-hmm. holding those anchors in metaphysical limbs that you're you're clinging to them it's you and meditation is a way of systematically letting go of everything you're holding when you let go of everything you're holding and then you return to your normal waking state you're able to voluntarily reattach to that which is rightly yours mm-hmm. you wake up and you love your family more because you have a clearer mind but you don't wake up and go, I'm going to pick Cheetos back up. You know, sometimes you might, but you're less likely to. Sure. Release everything, and then you can look around at everything you were attached to. And whatever is good and it, you know is a right attachment, you can voluntarily pick those back up. Choose to love your family, you know, yeah. instead of just loving them because you're attached to them. Voluntarily love your family. Everything that else that you put down, you can just leave it put down you don't have to pick it back up if you don't want to you can Mm -hmm. just leave it leave it there you know so non-greed picture yourself as a being of light who's stuck in the world because anchors keep him stuck in the world um and that'll help encourage you to let go of those things the nayamas the do's purity um especially purity of speech 
um, no gossip, like we just talked about in four agreements. Right. Be impeccable um, with your word. Yeah. Be impeccable with your word. Uh, contentment, discipline, self awareness, which includes being aware of your individual self and being aware of what you fundamentally are. Okay. Yeah. Um, surrender to God. Be surrendered to the Most High. Be surrendered to life itself. Don't mm-hmm. just be a thing that's alive but disconnected from life. Embody life. Be life. Be surrendered to that. Um, want what that wants for you. Don't want what that doesn't want for you. And, um, you know, there's another, there's a, a yoga doctrine called Patanjali's Eight Limbs. Patanjali in the yoga system is the sage of sages, the original sage, the um, first organized articulator of the system of yoga and the different versions of yoga. Okay. And he has a system called the Patanjali's Eight Limbs that's similar to Buddha's Eightfold Path. It's like eight aspects of life. Mm-hmm. If you organize yourself, if you orient yourself properly in each of these eight levels of life, then you'll be in the state of yoga. Oh, permanently. That's so similar. Yeah, 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 super similar. It's also similar to the Christian model, the fruits of the Spirit. If someone embodies the Holy Spirit, if someone is truly surrendered to the Most High, truly in union, mm-hmm. what will their personality look like? Joy, faithfulness, hope, self control, patience, kindness. Um, I don't remember all of them, but um, it, that's a different way of saying it because. The Patanjali's eight limbs and the Buddha eightfold path is more like, um, like breathe correctly, concentrate correctly, think correctly. There's some overlaps. There's some differences. Um, I'm going to not go into them at all. I like, I like the time that we're at. I like what I've covered. I highly recommend this training. I feel even though it was a relatively brief training, it only took me a couple weeks to get through. I feel genuinely confident going over to the juvie and saying not just that I'm a peer counselor who's in school for, for yoga ish stuff, but saying I'm a peer counselor and a meditation teacher Yeah, and having eight to 10 meditations that I can teach to different uh, young people for different reasons and different purposes. And that I can even tailor them a little bit to different belief systems. Like, I think the breathing and negativity, transforming it into pure love and breathing it out is great for Christians. I think that's a great Christian yeah. spiritual formation practice. Um, as the New Testament says, be for the world, not of the world. So be in the world, but be for the benefit of the world. But don't be defined by the world. Mm-hmm. Let God define you and act in the world from that perspective. Don't let the world set your tone. So you totally. walk into the room and you set the tone. And you set the tone in a, and you set the tone to a tone that is Christ-like. And if you if you embody that and you be that for the world, then you are evangelizing just by interacting. Like be Christ, embody that. Like I think that meditation is great for Christian spiritual formation. Um, I think people who are more on the secular side but are curious about what meditation might be would really benefit from yoga and or a guided meditation. Like, let me show you the peace that exists in your mind and how to unlock that. Mm-hmm. That's useful. I don't care what metaphysical uh, implications that may have. Uh, sure. I don't care what religious ideologies that might inspire within you. Just let me right. show you a peace that's in your mind and show you how to access that peace on command. Right. Um, that's useful to anyone. So... Highly recommend the training. It was dope. Um, I'm, Sounds great. I already signed up for their Yin Yoga program, so I'm gonna be I'm gonna get a yoga teacher certification and hopefully just keep running through programs on here. Brooke is in their Kundalini program, um, and uh, yeah, it's a badass platform. I'm all in. I'm gonna I'm gonna be on this platform for a while. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Night school. Night school.